This is a recording concerning pumps and how they work for MN AN2700 Thermodynamics. <clears throat> and I'm putting this recording together to help you with your assignment because there are a few pumps in the hydraulic schematic and we want to know how they work and how to analyze them. And so we need to just do a little bit about pumps and how they work in order to set you up for success there. So I've got the hydraulic schematic here and we are talking about, <clears throat> for example, uh, pump one here, pump two here. And if we zoom in, you can see a pump is given by a circle and a little arrow indicating direction of flow. So the flow here goes from left to right. Okay, the pump is driven by M, which is a motor. And we're given a volumetric flow rate here, 51.8 meters cubed per hour. That's a volumetric flow rate, and of course we could get a mass flow rate out of that, <clears throat> knowing the density of water. Okay, now this pump is forcing water through the pump, where it has a, a rising pressure, the pump's causing a rising pressure, and then the water is flowing through some sort of circuit, and <clears throat> coming back, and then it's dropping its pressure as it flows through the pipe, <clears throat> and coming back and then getting its pressure re-injected. So I just want to talk about uh, how we can understand pumps, how this is working, and go through some of the technical information that's been provided, and how to understand that. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse my voice. So let's come over into some blank space, and so we can talk a little bit about pumps. And I'd like to talk to pumps initially using the electrical analogy, because I think that it's something that we're all reasonably familiar with, Okay, if I draw a circuit, this is an electrical circuit, but hopefully the relevance will become fairly obvious. All right. And so if we've got some electrical circuit, we've typically got, say, a voltage source providing some direct um, current voltage V. <clears throat> and we can think about there being some resistance in the circuit, simple cir circuit, okay, the simplest circuit possible. And then we can think of there being some current, I, running through the circuit. And I think it's Kirchhoff's laws, say V equals I R, or for our interest, the amount of current that will flow through the wire equals the voltage divided by the resistance. Okay, so the higher the voltage, okay, the higher the potential to force the current to flow, <clears throat> the more current flows. Yeah, and the higher the resistance, the less current flows. It, uh, it prevents current from flowing. So that's our electrical circuit. And let's draw an analogous hydraulic circuit. Okay, so in the place of the battery, let me just zoom out so we can see everything. Good. In the place of the battery, we're going to put a pump. There's our pump pointing to the right with a little arrow. <clears throat> and it's going to provide some delta P. Okay. So pressure here is analogous to voltage. Then we're going to have some circuit of pipe work, okay? And that circuit will have some resistance to flow, which we're gonna call R just for the purpose of having um, it in our head, okay? So resistance in the hydraulic is analogous to resistance in the electrical. <clears throat> and then we're going to have some volumetric flow rate, V. <clears throat> All right. And volumetric flow rate in the hydraulic circuit is analogous to current, or the flow rate of electrons, <clears throat> if you like, in our electrical uh, circuit. Okay. And <clears throat> our analogy to this I equals V on R statement is that the flow rate volumetric flow rate is going to be a function of <clears throat> the pressure the pump provides and the resistance in a circuit. Okay, now that, that's not a linear function like it was in the electrical case. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the general idea is that <clears throat> if we have some pump that provides a higher dp or a higher increase in pressure as the flow goes through the pump, then we'll get more flow, we'll get more volumetric flow. And if we have a pipe that has a, a larger resistance, okay, and a larger resistance might be a longer pipe, 
So a pipe that's a kilometer long instead of a pipe that's 100 meters long, okay, will have more resistance. Okay, a pipe that is thinner. So a pipe the size of a straw, for example, is very hard to push lots of volumetric flow rate through, okay, but a pipe that's six or eight inches in diameter, <clears throat> you can get a lot more flow rate through. It also has to do with um, this resistance here, it has to do with the surface quality, um, the surface finish on the inside of the pipe and so forth. So there's a lot of things that go into resistance. We're just talking about pipes here, but obviously if there was a valve or a throttling mechanism, um, that would add resistance. An elbow, a corner, <coughs> adds resistance. So this resistance itself is a function of lots of things, okay? Um, and the pressure the pipe, the pump can produce is a function of other things we're just about to talk about. Okay, but we can get the sense that uh, there are things that can influence a volumetric flow rate, and those things are largely to do with what the pump provides and what the system uh, provides in terms of resistance. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit more about uh, resistance. <clears throat> so, if we drew a set of axes, and on the vertical axes we put dp, <clears throat> still thinking about a circuit. Okay, so that's why I'm saying delta P because it's coming in at some pressure <clears throat> and then the pressure is rising and the pressure is falling throughout the circuit until it gets stacked to the um, lowest pressure. So the lowest pressure in the system is immediately before the pump. The highest pressure in the system is immediately after the pump and that's similar to our voltage. So the highest voltage in the circuit is immediately after the DC, or the battery basically, and then the voltage drops as it goes around, actually, well, here it wouldn't drop, and then through the resistor it would drop to a lower potential, and then the lowest potential in the system is immediately prior to the, <coughs> to the uh, battery. Okay, so I'll put DP on that <coughs> axis, and we'll put volumetric flow rate on this axis. <coughs> and we're just trying to um, graph this function F. Actually, I'm going to put that F in blue. <coughs> All right. Now, if you want to push no volume through the system, then you need no delta P through your pump. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right? And you can push low amounts of flow through your system at low um, values of delta P across your pump. But the more and more flow rate you want to push through, <clears throat> you have increasing pressure. So it's not a linear system. If we were to do V equals I on R here, that would be a, um, a straight line. <clears throat> okay, it's not linear. We're going to call it a parabola, although the, the function is a little bit more complicated than that. <coughs> but <clears throat> just to give us a sense of what that, uh, that graph looks like. But how much volume flow rate do we have through the system? Well, it depends on what the pump provides. So let's talk a little bit about pumps and what they look like, and then we're going to draw an analogous curve for our pump as well. Now the pumps in this circuit are all centrifugal pumps or centripetal pumps, right? <clears throat> and we'll see a picture of it later, but I'll just draw one while we're here. So basically you've got a hub, and off that hub you've got what you might think of as blades or veins <clears throat> sticking out. Okay, here I'm drawing four veins on my pump, okay, and then the water's going to flow in, let's do water in blue, <clears throat> the water's going to flow into uh, the center here, these veins are going to turn around, okay, and there is a casing or a scroll around the outside, oops, it's not perfectly drawn, like that, <clears throat> Okay, and so as these veins turn around, they're forced by a motor to turn around. The water is drawn in near the hub. As these turn, it's forced to the outside by centrifuge or centripetal force. Okay, they're swept, the water's swept along the outside of the scroll. And when it gets up here, it goes out this pipe, out this outlet. <coughs> um, and some is, of course, entrained and goes around further and, and so forth. Okay, and so the idea here is, let's draw some, you have some motor driving a shaft and you've got this outer casing and cowling that forces the, the water, in, in our case, or hydraulic oil, 
whatever it is you're trying to pump, <clears throat> out the outlet. So let's think about the performance curve for this pump. So we call this a pump curve, okay? And we're gonna have some delta P and we're gonna have some volumetric flow rate. <clears throat> if we, what's called deadhead the pump, okay? So if we just have a blanking flange across this pipe, and so we don't allow any flow out of this pump at all, well, there'll be some pressure that the pump can produce. Let's do the pump curve in green. There'll be some pressure the pump curve can produce at zero volumetric flow rate. And that's the highest pump pressure that the pump will be able to produce. Okay, now let's open up this and make it a orifice plate with a small hole instead. So we're allowing some small volume flow. Well, the pressure, okay, and when I say DP, we're talking about the pressure before the pump and the pressure <clears throat> immediately after, after the pump, and so we're getting a DP being the difference between those two values, okay? <clears throat> so that's the pressure that's being induced by the, by the impeller. Well, you'll get some small volumetric flow rate at some lowered pressure, okay? And we could imagine uh, continuing this process <clears throat> until we had the shortest circuit imaginable. So essentially no resistance, we just pipe our pump straight back into our impeller inlet. <clears throat> okay, so essentially, essentially we've got no delta P or a very low delta P, okay? And we'd have some maximum flow rate the pump would be able to produce. And so we'll find that we get some sort of curve and that's not curving enough, hang on. <coughs> Let me draw this as accurate as I can. Yeah, there we are. So we get some sort of <clears throat> pump curve, okay? So we'll call this the pump curve. All right, <clears throat> and we'll call this blue line the system curve. <clears throat> and now, can you see what we're gonna do? Maybe, maybe, maybe. So now what we do is we impose the pump curve over the top of the system curve, <clears throat> all right, and we've got our same Units here, our delta P and our volumetric flow rate, okay? And so for a given pump, we impose, let's draw it here. Right, they're not scaled the same, right? So let's impose a pump curve there. Okay, so this was our pump curve P. Right? Then for this setup with this pump and this system, you'll find this will be the volumetric flow rate. Where these two lines intersect, we should do it in red. This will be the volumetric flow rate of the system. And then as a design engineer, you'll say, no, that's not good enough. I need more volumetric flow rate. And so you won't choose that pump. You'll choose this pump. Okay. And so this is, so we'll call this pump. I'll have to write the word one or pump two. Pump two. Okay. And pump two would give you this volumetric flow rate. You say, yes, that's the volumetric flow rate that my system requires we'll choose pump two for this application. Okay, and this is a basic <clears throat> idea of pump selection. Now you'll learn more about this in uh, fluid mechanics uh, in Eng 2500, uh, but if you haven't done that, this is a little introduction. And certainly anything that you learn in Eng 2500 that contradicts or extends on anything that I've said, you should go with what you learn in that subject. This isn't a fluid mechanics subject, uh, but it's certainly a bit of an introduction <clears throat> to this sort of thing. So now we've got some understanding of pumps and system curves and how things work. I want to take you through some of the technical information that you've been provided and see if you can now understand some of that information. <clears throat> so first of all, let's come across to the hydraulic schematic and we can see that we've got <clears throat> our pumps here. So we've got P1, P2, uh, P3, P4, and etc. Okay, and they're all on the hydraulic schematic. Now there is, <clears throat> there's two JPEGs called, uh, I think they've got the word pump in them. Anyway, in the first batch of information, okay, and they are the parts lists of um, the tri-generation system, and they list pump one, pump two, uh, for some reason on the second page, pump three and pump four, etc. 
and they give us, uh, let's, let's track pump one through the system. Okay, so pump one is called a pump sovereign. Okay, it's sold to us by Kellair. Um, I'm not quite sure about location. <clears throat> That's not the location on the schematic. Um, good, they're all part of the tri-generator. Now, model number. ADB65-160 running at 11 kilowatt. Okay, so this is important information, so we need to take that with us. <clears throat> serial number, so every pump that's produced will have a unique serial number. Um, I'd suggest that this pump might have been produced in 2011 um, based on that serial number. Oh, there you go. All right, so it was built sometimes during 2011. And so forth. <clears throat> huh. Design life five years. I'm making this video in 2019. I guarantee they haven't replaced the pump. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's one piece of information you've got. Another piece of information you've got is the catalog from um, Southern Cross. So they are selling sovereign pumps. Okay, and this is a bit of marketing material, right? But hopefully now you've seen a little bit of pumps, you'll get an appreciation for what's happening here. This is the motor shaft. So this is where we put our motor, <clears throat> okay? And our um, water is coming in to the center of our pump. It's going around our scroll and it's coming out. Whoops, red on red. And it's coming out the top. Okay, so that's how this pump is working. I think we've got a sectional view <coughs> later on. So this is, again, a picture um, showing water coming in, going around, and coming out the top, all right? And driven by a motor. So that just shows you the inlet. Uh, if I get rid of my drawing, there we are. So this shows you the inlet flange. So you'll bolt up your pipe onto that uh, onto that inlet flange. Um, <clears throat> there is a cross-sectional view, which I think might be a little bit informative. <clears throat> okay, so this shows the motor shaft where the motor attaches to. And again, just a different view, a different way of showing uh, the water coming in. It's directed using these flutes into the scroll. And you can see the scroll has a different um, amount of clearance there, a low amount of clearance, and it has a large amount of clearance there. So it is <clears throat> um, like, the, like on a snail's back. If you like, it's a spiral. So it starts with a very tight clearance and becomes larger, and then the water goes out that way. <clears throat> That's, uh, that shows you some components um, and gives you a sense of what's going on. Now, let's come over to these curves, and these are showing us some important information that I just want to talk through. And this is pump selection guide. Okay, now we know about pump curves, right? So I want you to be thinking in terms of pump curves when you look at these pumps, all right? The numbers in the middle are the designations of the pumps, okay? 50B32B160, right? 65B50B160, 65B50B160, 160 okay? Uh, now, what else can we see here? Total head in meters, all right? I want you to think about this in terms of delta P, okay? And volumetric flow rate down the bottom, okay? So we can think of these in terms of V dot, <clears throat> okay, that's pretty, that's hopefully self-explanatory. You can see the bottom is um, logarithmic, actually it's log log, so the volumetric flow rate is logarithmic, and the total head in meters is logarithmic as well. <clears throat> that lets us span a large range of values on a pretty small graph. Now these will be uh, inlet pipe diameter times outlet pipe diameter times impeller nominal diameter. Okay, so let's see if we can. So the impeller nominal diameter <clears throat> will be inside here, okay? So that dimension there will be diameter, okay? Because inside here we'll have our impeller, okay? And we'll have its veins sticking out like that, all right? <clears throat> Butchered their drawing, sorry about that. Okay, but the from the tip of one uh, impeller to the tip of one vein to the tip of the next vein, you can think of as being a diameter, okay? And that's this third number here, right? this 160. The inlet um, will have some sort of diameter as well. So in our case, that will be 50. This one will be 
32, and this would be 160, okay, in the case of this here. So it's a 50 v 32 v 160 pump, and it can produce up to, oh, yeah, let's use liters per second because that's what the vertical lines work, although you can use um, meters cubed per hour, which is what our hydraulic schematic uses. Okay, it can do about four and a half liters per second at a maximum flow rate, okay? Or <clears throat> if we ran it at a very low flow rate, it can produce a maximum of about, uh, what are you, about 11 meters of head, uh, which is a measure of delta P. We can talk about that briefly. So the idea there is if at the outlet of the pump, so we've got a pump here, okay, if we had an outlet and we just had a vertical standpipe, okay, the question is, uh, at some point, the fluid, uh, let's have a vertical pipe, there we are, at some point you're going to have a fluid level, okay, and the question is, how high is that above the outlet of the pump, and we could measure that height in meters, let's call it height, height or head, capital H, which is measured in meters, okay, <clears throat> that's a way of measuring how much pressure the pump can put out. And it's relatively uh, stable for the pump. Okay, so if you use a lighter fluid, right, and there's, there's no fluid that's as light as air, but you can imagine if you're using something like air, well then the delta P would be smaller throughout the pump, but the head height in meters would be the same. So it's, it's more accurate to give a head height in meters and then let the engineer do the conversion to work out what the delta P in kilopascals would be, than to give a different pump curve for each different density of fluid, with the lighter fluids giving less pressure in kilopascals. So that's how they're reported, <coughs> total head in meters. Excellent, so what you can see here is pumps with larger inlets and outlets, okay, produce a similar, um, total head in meters, a similar pressure, but greater flows as we go to the right hand side, so larger inlet and outlet, okay? And pumps with larger impeller diameters, 200 millimeters, 250 millimeters, 315 millimeters, okay? 500 millimeters, okay? With larger impeller diameters produce more uh, delta P, okay? So to go up this graph, it's not good enough to have just larger inlets and outlets, <clears throat> you have to go a larger impeller as well. But a larger impeller, uh, where's our 65 B50, B160, okay? A 65 B40, B315, so this has a much larger impeller diameter. It doesn't produce much more volumetric flow rate. It's a similar size inlet and outlet, okay? So that's just a way of specking a pump. And so, like I was saying before, as an engineer, you would have some system curve, draw a system curve, and you would have some desired volumetric flow rate, say 50 meters per cube per hour, and you'd come up here and you'd say, <coughs> right, um, I can use an 80, B50, B250 pump from this pump manufacturer, and I'll artificially increase my system curve by putting in a valve, and I'll get, I'll pick up the curve there. Okay, so pump selection guide produced by the uh, pump manufacturer and says, well, buy this pump based on what you want. Now they've got this at <coughs> this speed, this is one speed, that fixed speed motor could be expected to turn, 1450 RPM, or at 2900 RPM, okay, the same pump can give you different performance. So this pump here that we were talking about earlier, this 50B32B160 pump, if you run it at uh, 1,450 RPM, if you run that same pump twice as fast, it now produces um, this performance characteristic. So again, you can manipulate whether you're using a, a two or four pole motor, for example. Uh, so how fast will your motor go? Therefore, can you manipulate which pump you need? <coughs> Excellent, so that's our overview of pumps and their performance. Now, let's go, there's a bunch of other information. 
Um, this information is shown better on another document. When you buy a pump, you might get something like this. So this tells you, for example, um, the bolt down dimensions, okay? So you need to know where to put your bolts. So this says you've got some slots and there's some dimensions based on which model number you're buying and so forth. Okay, so how much clearance do you need to have between it and the thing that's above it? Um, and so you need some um, outside dimensions. And so this is something you would expect to see when you buy it. And then when you're buying a pump, you might get one of these, which is um, things like, what's the actual impeller diameter? Oh, we should talk about that as well. Good, excellent. Um, so, you know, this is a 40B40B96 40 40 pump. And um, what's it made out of? Will it corrode? No, it's all stainless steel and aluminium. Um, <coughs> so they're all relatively um, resistant to corrosion, which is good. Um, now, so this is information. This is information, interestingly, on a pump that um, is not used in this circuit. So I don't know why it exists in the information that was handed over, <coughs> but it's quite good detail in terms of what you expect from a pump. Um, now, this has a pump curve as well. So it's got, as you can see, um, delta P on the vertical axis and volumetric flow rate here in meters cubed per hour. Okay, volumetric flow rate on the horizontal axis. <clears throat> and there's our main pump curve. All right, but there's some other information as well. <clears throat> okay, efficiency. And for want of something better, we could call it isentropic efficiency. So it's got some peak of efficiency and then a drop off. So it wants to operate in this kind of range. At that point, it has an um, efficiency of about 70%. Um, <coughs> how much power is then consumed? Uh, is you need more volumetric flow rate, you need more power. And net pressure suction head values is something that I won't talk about, um, but you can look at that in fluid mechanics and there's some more dimensional information as well. Now, <coughs> impeller actual diameter, I should have talked about. So let's pick up a drawing of an impeller, pick up a drawing of a pump. Right, <coughs> so we're gonna manufacture this pump and it's going to be a something, okay? Like a 40 B40 40 B100, okay? But <coughs> if that performs just a little bit too, I don't want to say good, but the the delta P per, per volumetric flow rate is a little bit too high than what you want, okay? So you don't want that, you don't want the next pump down because the next pump's down is down there, okay? But you want something like this. So just a little bit lower performance, right? And these impellers, these impeller blades are 100 millimeters long, nominal, okay? Instead of building a whole new casing, a whole new scroll, a whole new mounting dimensions, okay, for something that, say, 96 millimeters would do it, okay, what you can instead do is you just machine off these impellers so they're slightly shorter, okay, and when they're slightly shorter, they give you slightly lower DP for the same volumetric flow rate, and you produce a pump with a slightly lower curve than the nominal spec. Okay, so you'll find pumps have some nominal uh, impeller diameter, and then they have some actual impeller diameter. Sorry, so for this, <coughs> right, this is these numbers here, right, actual impeller diameter, and we can manipulate our performance of our pump by either putting a slightly larger impeller in or a slightly smaller impeller, <clears throat> it generally mucks our efficiencies up a little bit, but um, for the sake of building a whole new casting and machining process to build a new spec pump, the idea of just machining an impeller down or making a slightly oversized impeller, okay, making a slightly oversized impeller, uh, that's a very attractive manufacturing option. And so we'll see that come into play. All right, <clears throat> now we are almost ready to look at pump one <coughs> and start to think about what it looks like. So let's come up the top. 
I had said we would look at pump one, okay? Pump one, and it is a 80B65B160 running at 11 kilowatts, all right? Now there is a, a document uh, in the second batch of information called detailed pump information, I think it's called, or extensive pump information, okay? And it has uh, this information in it, okay? And it's got lots of these. Um, uh, oh, no, it's got one of these. So this is a more detailed selection chart, okay? So this is like um, the, this chart here, okay? With the yellow and the green, okay? It's in black and white, and it's just a little bit more detailed, okay? So again, this is where you draw, you design your system, you draw your known system curve, and you say, yep, I want this pump. Okay, so this is how you select them. This is if it was traveling at 1450, and again, traveling at 2900. The scales are different, so you go, oh, that's my system curve. Oh, that pump will do it. Cool, <clears throat> so that's just a reproducing production of that information. Now, pump 01 was a 80B65, uh, sorry, dash 160 running at 11 kilowatts. So we come down in this document to the page that's titled 80B65-160. All right. Now, there's one traveling at 2900 RPM and there's one traveling at 1450, 1420 RPM. All right. <clears throat> the maximum power of the one at 2900 is 11.04 kilowatts. The maximum power at the lower RPM is 1.4 kilowatts. So we're probably talking about this graph at the top, okay? <clears throat> yeah, because we're looking at an 11 kilowatt hour unit. Now, I talked about reduction of impeller diameter, okay? So let's look at all of the different lines on this graph and <clears throat> work out what's going on. One of the lines is, what is the real diameter of the impeller? Okay, the nominal diameter of the impeller is 160, okay? But what's the real diameter? We can have it undersized down to 146, okay? Or we can have it oversized up to 182. <coughs> so that's our range of impeller diameters that fit in this unit, okay? And these are the pump curves, so delta P measured in uh, head in meters, as mentioned, volumetric flow rate, measured in either litres per second or metres cubed per hour, either way. <coughs> All right. We've also got lines of constant power. Okay, so these are lines of constant power going through here. So this is actual power draw, five and a half, seven and a half, <coughs> and there'll be some 11 over there. Okay, so that's lines of constant power. We've got lines of constant efficiency. Okay, so these up here are efficiencies, 40%, 50%, 60%, and these are lines of constant efficiency, okay? So where do you want to run your pump? You want to run your pump in here, okay? So you, you want to run your pump in this region here. If your pump's not running in this region here, then you might think about another pump because there's no point running a pump at 40 percent <coughs> down here okay the pump's too big you you're looking for only this much flow rate okay choose a smaller pump basically all right so uh and then here is uh net pressure suction head um down here as well which i won't talk directly to so for us <coughs> we say well, what is the actual impeller diameter um we don't have that information unfortunately uh, so the best we can do is assume that um, our pump is a, a nominal diameter, so it follows this kind of line here. We do have, <coughs> from the hydraulic schematic, the actual flow rate of pump 01. And so I'm just going to go back to that hydraulic schematic for those who um, don't remember such things. And that said it was 51.8 <coughs> meters cubed per hour. So let's come back down <coughs> here. 51.8 is about there, say. So I can draw a line up. 
let me let me draw a line in blue. Okay, so draw a line up to our normal pump limits, and so our pump is performing here. Okay, so we can get actual current draw, <coughs> actual um, power draw is a bit over five and a half kilowatts. Um, actual delta P is about there. Um, so 35 meters of head, which you can convert to a KPA fairly trivially. Uh, actual efficiency is running uh, a bit more than 78%. 79% is going to be here, so it's 78.5% you know, uh, is the isentropic efficiency of the pump. Okay, and so that is then enough information to do a simple first law analysis on the pump. Okay. Um, you know the temperature of the water, so therefore you know the density. You've got volumetric flow rate, <clears throat> you've got DP, because you've got, uh, you can convert that to KPA, all right? And so in our thermodynamic terms, we would say the work of the pump equals uh, volumetric flow rate times delta P, all right? And because this isn't perfectly efficient, we need to divide that by the efficiency. Right? <coughs> and you should have all of that information represented here. You can do the same for the other pumps. I haven't got the other pump uh, uh, sheets here as a little addendum. Yeah, let's do a little addendum. Um, there's a different way of thinking about these pumps, which is what if instead of varying the impeller diameter, okay, what if we fix the impeller diameter and vary the speed? And so that's what this shows. This shows different speeds in RPM from two and a half thousand to three and a half thousand, and from one and a half thousand to two and a half thousand. Okay, so this line here is this line here, same thing. Okay, and what would that tell us? about efficiency, about net section, um, suction pressure head, about power, um, and so forth. Okay, so the idea here is that you'd use a motor with a variable RPM, a triple VF motor, so variable voltage, variable frequency motor, and you would control it, and you'd speed the motor up or slow the motor down um, to produce different pump curves to suit your system. Right? A different way of producing the required flow, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is get a pump with a fixed curve and then have a valve that you throttle the valve closed when you want to restrict the flow and you open the valve when you want to allow more flow and so you leave your pump going at some constant RPM and some constant setup um, and use a valve. Typically a triple VF motor is a more expensive installation cost, yeah, expensive to install um, but it uses the least amount of power <clears throat> that the system should use. Okay, a um, direct online pump, which just has a fixed speed, will be um, cheap to install, but it'll be more expensive to run because it'll end up consuming more power as you throttle the valve and introduce unnecessary system resistance. But that's, uh, that's all a little bit out of scope um, for our discussions. So hopefully you found that interesting and helpful. Uh, a little bit of an introduction to pumps and reading pump curves um, and how to read the specific pump curve related to one of the pumps in this assignment. Um, and hopefully that will help you with your thermodynamic analysis of the tri-generation system. Uh, thanks for your time. Bye.